Allah'ın mesleği ve selamı ala Resulüne Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn. Subhaneke la ilme ve la ilme alem tene inneke ente alimun hakim. Good evening everyone. İnşallah we'll start the last leg of the great figures of Islam. Bedir Zaman Said Nursi. We're going to cover him inşallah. Now Said Nursi is a really interesting figure. He covers the last part of Ottoman Empire, the early part of the modern era, uh, kind of the oppressive uh, 1930s, 20s, 40s uh, regimes in Muslim world, uh, and, uh, and beginning of the new era with Cold War and democratic aspects in 1950s and so on. He is born in 1976, uh, 1876 and dies in 1960. So it's a long 84 years of uh, life covers a pivotal time. It's a transition between the classic uh, Islamic civilization to a whole new modern, not yet civilization, upheavals. So he comes in that pivotal time in, in Muslim history. Now, uh, Said Nursi, the good thing about Said Nursi is that we know a lot of his, about his life, being a, a modern or relatively recent scholar. Um, the, the disadvantage with the scholars who lived about a thousand years ago, the information about them is scanty and sometimes unreliable. But we know a lot about Said Nursi. Uh, the other advantage is that I have studied his works and his life quite a bit, so I know a lot about uh, him perhaps more than uh, anyone else. Now, uh, Said Nursi is, was a, quite an exceptional scholar uh, that left, left his mark uh, in the intellectual annals of Islamic civilization. But also he has introduced uh, a, a way of Islamic revival that I think is quite unique and, uh, and, and it's still applicable for our time. Now uh, he lived, uh, he was born in a town, a small village of Nurs, therefore his name Nursi, he comes from that village. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a Kurdish area, it's in present-day Turkey, but during the Ottoman Empire it was known as the, the Vilayat of Kurdistan, the province of uh, Kurdistan, which is the place of where Kurdish people lived. Uh, it was you know, seen as one whole entity rather than carved up form that we see today. Um, although he was born in that part of the world, he is actually, uh, there's an uh, Ottoman archival scholar who, who said that he brought some evidence document to suggest that his parents were registered uh, in the registrar of the descendants of the Prophet Now, uh, the Ottomans, uh, they kept, there was a junior ministry called Nakib al-Ashraf. Uh, they, they dealt with the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ because they were exempt from military uh, uh, serving in the military and uh, they were exempt from some taxes. Naturally, because of those advantages, uh, it, there, there had to be some evidence for you to be included in that registrar. But that's a very strong evidence to suggest that he's... Uh, actually, the, the documents say that he's, from his father's line, he belonged to the Hassan and from his mother's line, Hussein. So his both lines is quite strong. But naturally, you know, in the Muslim world, uh, it's been one and a half thousand years, uh, the, the, um, the descendants of the prophets are not pure lines, you know. There is always intermarriages that happen. Uh, so you, you, s you can see sometimes uh, th they can sort of fit into the ethnicity of the area that they live in. But they do come from that line. Uh, actually, when Said Nursi showed some uh, early brilliance when he was studying, his teachers wondered why he was so special. Uh, he was a child prodigy and uh, uh, very, quite different to other kids and students of his time. Uh, and uh, they wondered, they wanted to visit his parents and uh, went to his house. Uh, the father was on the field, you know, he was a farmer. The mother, uh, they waited outside. While they were waiting outside, they asked the mom, mother, uh, how did you raise Saeed? And she said, 
Well, as soon as I knew I was praying it to him, I've never stepped on the ground without ablution. And I always breastfed him when I was in the state of ablution. And, uh, and then uh, a few hours later, his father comes uh, with some uh, cows or, or oxen, and the, the, the mouth of the cows are covered. And the, the teachers ask, why have you covered the mouth of the, of the cows? And he says, um, well, when I go to my uh, farm, uh, I cross other people's farm. I don't want my cows to eat f f uh, vegetables and plants from other people's farm so that my family is not fed with haram. And the teachers go back saying, no wonder. Uh, so obviously, mother and father are important and how they uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu actually, he said, the Sahaba come says, how should I raise my kids? Uh, he says, while well, they're in mother's womb. He said, how, Ya Rasulullah? By feeding uh, the family with halal. So that's the best education we can start our kids. And we have a baby out the back. <laughs> uh, so sister, no uh, feeding without ablution, inshallah. Uh, Ahmed, you can start covering the <laughs> mouth of the cows. Um, but uh, Said, uh, when he started his madrasa at the age of nine, uh, he was really, um, he couldn't handle the madrasa education all the time a little bit because it was very slow. Uh, sometimes uh, some kids who were there for a while, they started to teach. But anyone who comes new, they, they act like they're teachers and sometimes even the, the sheikh makes them teach. So, Said didn't want any of that, he wanted to be taught by the sheikh. And uh, he said, why, why should I... Uh, and, and he was quite brilliant as well, easy to pick up. So all these things frustrated him sometimes, other kids picked on him. And he, he sort of goes to a madras and leaves uh, after a while, goes again and leaves after a while. Until uh, at the age of 12, and at, by then, you know, he's just learning basics, Arabic and so on. Uh, at the age of 12, he sees a dream. And he sees three significant dreams that shaped his, his life. And this was the first one. And in the dream, um, he says, it's Day of Judgment. And, um, and you know, it's the Qiyamah occurred, the doomsday, people are dead, are resurrected. Um, uh, they're being judged. And he's thinking, I need to see the Prophet I have to see him. Where can I see him? Well, everyone's going to cross the Sirat Bridge. If I go in front of that, I, I can see him. And he does that. Uh, I mean, it's a dream. You can do that in the dream. <laughs> and uh, so he sees the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, and then he kisses his hand and says, Ilim Ya Rasulallah, you know, knowledge, Ya Rasulallah. And he says, the Prophet says, knowledge will be granted to you uh, on the condition that you don't ask any question to my ummah. And, um, and uh, from then on, Sayyid Nusi, he never asked anybody any question. And uh, he even well, later in his life, when he goes to Istanbul, at the time seat of the capital of the caliphate, you know, he puts a sign on his door, hotel door, uh, all questions answered, no questions asked. <laughs> um, so actually, that dream works. Uh, because it, there's this love for learning put in his heart and he goes to another uh, with a higher sheikh in another city and actually finishes the whole 15 year of madrasa education in three months. Now, at that time, the madrasa education is based on uh, basically studying texts. You study, you read the text uh, before the sheikh and the sheikh you know, comments on it, explains it, and then you get assessed. And the assessment is usually a verbal, oral examination. And uh, basically, all the books that, on, that are on the curriculum, he studies it, and he goes to the sheikh, test me. And says, okay, what is this? What is that? Uh, and he answers everything. Basically, he passes, and he gets his ijaza at the age of 14 years of age. And, uh, and he was able to do that because he had photo photographic memory. 
and amazing cognitive skills. Like he was very intelligent, but also he had photographic memory. He would read it once, and he would commit to the memory. And uh, actually, uh, someone else, they were amazed by, by him, another sheikh, he wanted to test him, and gave him just three uh, root verbs, in uh, words in Arabic. You know, in Arabic, you can derive words from uh, some root words. He gave three words, um, and, uh, and actually asked, uh, so, uh, sorry, yeah, he gave three words, he asked him to come up with 20 words from that. I take that, but he gives him just one, one verb. Uh, and he, he asks him to drive 20 words. He not only comes with 20 words, but puts them in a sentence. Um, and then he says, okay, here's a book, 10 pages, study it. And uh, he just spends a couple of minutes and says, test me on those. And uh, he, he was that amazing. Uh, like sometimes people have that photographic memory, by, but they lack intelligence. Sometimes people intelligent, they like memory. But he was combining the both. Um, so at the age of 14, he basically is qualified to teach. And he goes around, enters these uh, munazara, uh, the, the debates. And, um, and, he, and he wins all of them. And uh, everyone's just, everyone comes with books, and he comes with relax and no books. Uh, so he makes a bit of a fame for himself. And that's when he gets the name Bediru Zaman, which means the wonder of uh, the times. Uh, sorry? Uh, 16, 17, uh, at, at those age. Um, and so yeah, he's sort of going around, and he's traveling from town to town, uh, still in the eastern regions in the, uh, of Ottoman Empire. And he goes to a city called Mardin. Uh, Mardin is famous for its stone buildings. It's a very nice city, actually. And at that time, at the, he meets two people f who are traveling. These are activists, Islamic activists, and they are followers of Jamal al Afghani. Now, Jamal al Afghani is a major figure in 19th century. He died in 1898, and he's also the teacher of Muhammad Abduh. And Muhammad Abduh, is a very important figure in Egypt. He was the Mufti and the head of the Athar University. Uh, and he died in 1909. Um, and they, uh, his student is Rashid Rida. Uh, they do a commentary of the Quran. Uh, I think um, with uh, Muhammad Abduh, they could only get up to uh, Surah Nisa, verse 125. In the magazine called Al Manar, it was a weekly publication. Rashid Rida continues that, and he dies in 1935, and he goes up to uh, uh, Surah Yusuf, the 12th chapter in the Quran. Uh, now, they are known as Salafis, early Salafis, Muhammad Abdu. But Salafism for Muhammad Abdu was, uh, we have to go back to the original uh, progressive spirit of Islam and, uh, and do new ijtihad. So his thing was, we have to go to the time of the Salaf, just like they made new ijtihad to find, to develop Islam, we got to do the same. It wasn't the Salafism we have today, uh, which is kind of inspired from the uh, Saudi Arabian Wahhabism. Uh, now, uh, he meets with them briefly, and this is important in that he doesn't, like Said Nursi doesn't become a student of Jamal al Afghani, but he's exposed to the greater issues that are engulfing the Muslim world at that time. Uh, and, uh, and he starts being active, or he starts talking about these issues, mainly freedom and constitutionalism. Constitutionalism at that time was like democracy, you know. Uh, you know, you have the monarchy, and they were saying we have to jumhuriyat. You know, it was called jumhuriyat. Uh, that, that is, you know, rule of the people through a parliament, through a constitution, and so on. It was very uh, a widespread thought, and actually, Jamaat and Afghani supported that, um, and many others also. And more hurriyat, which is the freedom. Um, that got him in trouble. You know, because 
these were no-nos at that time to get into it, or you were entering into the realm of society and a little bit of politics as well, or it has political repercussions. And he's actually arrested, 17 years old, he's arrested. And they shackle him and they're taking him to the city of Van. And on the way, um, uh, there's two soldiers. Um, on the way, uh, he says, well, it's time for prayer. He says, untie me, I'm, I need to have ablution. The soldiers say, no, we can't. And he actually goes to the river and unshackles himself and has ablution and prays. This is a karama. It's a wonder working. It's actually one of the first. He's done a few others are attributed to him. But this is important because um, uh, he, it makes him famous. The soldiers become his students, <laughs> and, and quickly the, the news spreads across, and he becomes famous. So with scholars, you, the pedigree of a scholar is very important. And you really need three things. A good nasab, you know, the attrib being attributed to a, a famous person. And actually, when we, you know, when we said that he's related to the Prophet he's rela related through Abdul Qadir Jilani's line as well. Uh, that's even stronger. Like Abdul Qadir Jilani is a major figure. He died in uh, 1166. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also knowledge and piety. Knowledge, he's already proven himself by getting a jazz at the age of 14. And the piety, like being a saintly person, he's just got everything at the age of 17. So immediately he's grabbing attention. Is uh, Everybody looks at him as a wa wonder of time, a wonder boy uh, or scholar, sheikh. And um, so with someone like that, the famous people, rich and famous, uh, they get their kids to be treated by scholars like that. And he's young, he's able to relate to you know, young people. So Tahir Pasha, uh, who is the governor of Ottoman Empire of, of the Eastern States, he invites him to tutor his children, um, and also others as well in this in the city of Van. Van is Van is located at the moment in northern Iraq, in the within Turkey, but uh, the south of it is northern Iraq, um, and um, so at that uh, when he goes to this city of Van, because there's a lot of government uh, departments and uh, uh, army officers, you know, state officials, he's now uh, talking to them and he's actually uh, get ex gets exposed to uh, philosophical and scientific ideas for the first time. And Tahir Pasha has this amazing uh, library. And, and he's, he reads all these books, like he's got photographic memory, he's just uh, in one week, he probably finishes many books. And he commits to his memory 90 key texts of Islam, 90 key Islamic books. And some of them are very thick. That includes Arabic dictionary uh, that he, he memorizes. And, and he continuously recites this every day for three hours to maintain it in his memory uh, at that time. Uh, and um, so, like he's trained in religious sciences, but now he's also studies uh, science as well. Actually, he has a debate with an army officer about a mathematical problem. He actually says, okay, let's have a debate two days later, and he reads all mathematical books and beats it in the debate, in just two days. Um, it's quite brilliant, uh, as you can see. So at that time, he can also see that some of these army or, or official or intellectuals at that time are very much uh, uh, attracted by the Western ideas or modern modernity. And they are starting to, uh, and he's reading other people's books as well, or the, the Muslim intellectuals, and they're everywhere, you know, in Istanbul, Cairo, uh, Tehran, Baghdad, in the major centers of the Muslim world, the intellectuals are gravitating towards modernity and Western ideas. And they are sort of saying that if we should abandon religion, we should separate religion and the society and so on. Um, the, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people are affected by that. 
And you can see that this is the result of a dual education system. You know, at that time, um, or in the early 1900s, sorry, 1800s, Ottoman Empire and many other places, they see that, oh, they've fallen backward to Europe, and the Europe is starting to uh, have victories in battlefields, and they attribute it to better science and technology, and therefore they say, we need new schooling and they opened these mektabs. And mektabs, you studied science and modern you know, disciplines, a little bit of religion, but not too much. But the madrasa was heavily studying um, religious disciplines, and they were producing two different types of people. And that was fragmenting the entire Muslim world from within. This is a very important observation of Said Nursi. And he, he says that uh, studying religion, through the study of religious sciences, the conscience is illuminated. Through the study of science, the mind is illuminated. When you merge the two, haqiqa manifests, the truth comes out. And, uh, and they are like the two wings of a bird. With one wing you cannot fly. So you need both religious sciences and material sciences to com produce a complete human being. Uh, and this actually becomes his, uh, his uh, mission. And, uh, and at that time, uh, um, he says, I'm going to build a madrasa. And I'll call this madrasa zahra as opposed to Ashar Madrasa. Because they're both Zahra and Ashar come from the same word. And he basically wants to replicate Ashar University in the East. In Van, which was a which is a cross section of it's an intersection of you know Turks, Kurds, Persians and Arabs. It's a perfect location uh, to have a university where everybody could study together and you could unify you could unify education and you could unify through that the Muslim world and the consciousness. It's a very bold project and pretty appropriate you know, for its time. And I, I think we still haven't got to that point, especially now. Um, and just as the, all of this is happening, um, Tahir Pasha has six daughters. He has this big house. And uh, Saad Nusri, he's very, he's a very ethical person. He doesn't even look at the girls in their faces. He stays there for two years, and he says that if I see him on the street, I wouldn't recognize him. He, sometimes his friends come and visit them. Within a couple of days, they start conversing with these girls. There. I mean, there's nothing wrong, maybe. They're not doing anything wrong. Um, but Cyprus is very particular about this. Uh, and by the way, he, he never gets married. Uh, and the reason, we could discuss the reason later. And one day, as he's you know, studying in his room, one of the girls maybe cleaning the house, she probably thought that he wasn't in the room. He wanted to go into the room and clean the room. He just enters, she enters without knocking. That's it, he gets very angry. How dare you come into the room while I'm here? Uh, and he decides to leave the place. And, um, and even later, a few years later, when he's in Istanbul, um, a couple of people, uh, this, a couple of the, his scholar friends decide to test him on this. And on a busy day in the Bosphorus, you know, when they, before they had all the bridges that were going by rowing boats, uh, on, a, um, on a day of celebration, usually when uh, Christians in the city would go on the Bosphorus, and they weren't covered, you know. Uh, he, they decide to cross the uh, strait, which takes about an hour. And when they get to the other side, they say, you haven't even looked once to Haram, you know. And uh, why? How, how, how do you do that? He goes, why should I do something if I'm going to be, feel guilty afterwards? And the guilt would stay with me forever while a pleasurable thing would only be a, be a fleeting moment. So it just shows you how 
in particular he is in religious practice at that young age. Um, so he decides to go to Istanbul and uh, he's going to, you know, um, uh, promote this building of the madrasa. And at that time it's the time of Caliph Abdul Hamid. Um, unfortunately, it's not a good time to go into Istanbul because there's a lot of uh, in political instability. Um, and he's involved, he becomes a member of this um, association of Muhammad, um, it's called, as opposed to some maybe secular looking, uh, the cup which was the Ittihad and Taraki, which was a, like a union of progress and unity. They were more secular and then there were these religious organizations or political movements. He joins them, but he never, it doesn't become like overtly political, he just talks about issues related to society or being debated at that time. He writes for newspapers, makes speeches, very active. Um, but in 1908, there's a coup. A coup happens, the, uh, the party of the uh, progress and unity topple up to Hamid II and they take over the country in 1908. Just think about 1918, when just about the, in 10 years they destroyed the empire. Uh, so uh, Abdul Hamid is toppled, house arrested, and then there is a counter coup that uh, fails. It happens, but it fails. And and uh, after that, Said Nusri just leaves. He's actually trialed in that. They put some trial and executing people, you know. And he is, they, say, they say to him, I, they, tell, they say that you're a member of uh, this association of Muhammad. He says, yes, I am. I am a member. He says, our center is Mecca. You know, our, we have a branch in Medina. And, uh, you know, our office is uh, Kaaba. <laughs> you know, we have 350 million members. <laughs> Uh, he gives this kind of answers. He's never apologetic in these court cases, and he's got, he, he has this fearless stance. I mean, he's very respectful, but he just gives these answers, and it makes judges smile, and they actually release him, let him go. And uh, so he goes back to East, and uh, continues, you know, preaching, teaching, and so on. Uh, and he, um, in... 1911, he goes to Damascus. There's a famous Damascus sermon. In um, he's uh, 30 years of age by then, and um, uh, he goes to Umayyad Mosque, and uh, he gives uh, this sermon to 10,000 congregation, and they say that there was about 100 scholars within that. Uh, and that's published actually. It's available. I really like the way he begins the sermon. He, he says, uh, you Arab brothers, uh, Islam came to you. We learned Islam from you. And what I'm about to tell you, consider it that a student has learned from his teacher and, and he's repeating it to, so that his teacher can check whether he's learned it properly. Uh, it's a very humble way of beginning. I, I really like that. And obviously that relaxes that. Uh, the audience who are probably thinking, who is this guy, who does he think he is? Um, but he gives a very long sermon and he analyzes the problems of the Muslim world. He basically says um, it's poverty, ignorance, and uh, division, uh, ikhtilaf. And these are the three main problems. I think <laughs> we still are in that stage, there are still the three main problems of the Muslim world. But it just tells you how his foresight, you can see the root causes of things. And he gives some remedy. He makes some interesting remarks there. Like for example, he goes, uh, truthfulness is very important for Islam and Muslims, for example. You know, there's a fatwa. If you're going to, for a good cause, you could maybe lie sometimes. If you're going to make up between two people who are, don't, who are not talking to one another. He goes, even this fatwa, there has to be a moratorium on that. Because people are abusing it. We can't lie at all, that's it. You can't, you're not even uh, well-intended white, white things. Uh, that's all deception. The Muslims have to get a move away from these things. 
Another thing that really sticks to my mind is um, he says, um, although the Muslim world looks bleak, its fortunes at that time, but it's one of the most fertile era for Islam itself. Because Islam is based on reason. Because in this time, people are bringing out the reason a lot. And he says the reason why a lot of non-Muslims who did, did not convert to Islam was because of the, of the ignorance that they had. They had to rely on the, you know, the, the priests or religious leaders, clerics, for if they wanted to know something, they would ask them, and whatever they said, they believed. They accepted. But these days, now, in this era, they go independently searching. So because this is very important. And it's actually good for Islam, good for Muslims. So he's got these angles, although he puts the, uh, he talks about problems, he always gives you hope. Actually, he lists despair as one of the main sicknesses in the Muslim world. Because if, if you have despair, that's it, you'll be lost. You can't do anything without that. So we always have to be hopeful. Uh, and, and then sort of he comes back, he establishes this. Um, um, and yeah, at that time he sees the, his second dream. And uh, in this dream, um, actually this second dream was before he left the city of Van. Uh, the Mount Ararat, which is sort of interpreted as the, the boat of Noah, rested on that mountain. Because that mountain in his dream explodes. And underneath it is underneath is Quran. So Quran is exposed. And the pieces go all around the world. And he says that um, an important person appeared before me. And he commanded me to uh, announce, proclaim the miraculousness of the Quran. And he wakes up. He doesn't say who that important person is, but others interpret it as it was the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he goes, around, just, just very soon after that dream, um, the Tahir Pasha, who is the governor, he gives him a, a newspaper. And in the newspaper, uh, there's a news about what Galston said. Galston was... Uh, the, uh, the minister or secretary for the colonies of the British Empire in the House of Lords reportedly, according to that newspaper, um, Garson says, puts a copy of the Quran in the House of Lords and it says, Muslims love this book unless we m either stop them reading it or uh, we can't destroy it so we either have to make them stop reading it or uh, remove the love from their heart for the Qur'an. And without that, we will never be able to dominate Muslims. That's what the newspaper says. And this makes Musa angry and, or determined. He says, he, he, uh, he says, I'm going to show the world how inextinguishable sun the Qur'an is. Actually, that's the second important dream. He feels determined um, because the mountain is exploding, meaning that all the protective uh, walls around the Quran will collapse, and that the Qurans or truths of the Quran will be exposed, and somebody has to defend it. Um, because attacking Quran as truth means collapsing the entire religion of Islam. Uh, yeah, so he establishes this uh, madrasa in, uh, in uh, Van. Um, uh, and ob obviously he's always teaching, but when he's sort of uh, starting this madrasa from his own means, uh, this time uh, Sultan Reshat, the Ottoman Caliph and the Sultan, he invites him, he's going on a, a trip to the Balkans, first time an Ottoman Sultan is actually doing a foreign visit. Uh, and uh, 
And he's invited to represent the eastern provinces as a scholar to come as a delegation. He goes, great, this is my great opportunity. You know, I want to build that Madrasa to Zahra, the university. I can convince the Sultan to fund it. And he actually goes with him uh, and, uh, and he convinces the Sultan that he should fund it. And they allocate a budget even. Uh, and he takes that money, comes and they lay the foundations in the city of Van, of a, this huge university. He's very happy, you know, he's going to have study, have these students, and he's got a few thousand students by then. Um, so he basically changes the madrasa curriculum system, because this is too slow, this is not getting anywhere, we need a new curriculum. Obviously, still study core Islamic sciences and disciplines and books, but also add other things, science, and make it faster, um, and, and focus on skills and, uh, rather than just memorization, uh, which is still a problem today in our time. So just when everything was going well, World War I starts. And, uh, uh, and you know, in the east, you've got the Russians coming in. There's this issue with Armenians there at that time. Um, so Nursi actually becomes an adjunct commander. He, uh, he leads a volunteer army against the Russians, about 5,000 people, basically made up of his students. And, and defense starts you know, joining in the battles. And, uh, his main city, Bitlis, falls, and he's wounded and captured. Most of his students die, uh, martyred. And he's taken all the way to this place called Kosturma, which I looked in the, uh, you know, the map. It's about 450 kilometers north of Moscow. It's all the way, uh, thousands of kilometers. He's taken there into a concentration camp. And this is uh, 1915. So he stays there for a couple of years. And a few things happen uh, at that time. One of the famous incidences, which is later told by witnesses. Um, one day, uh, the, the commander-in-chief of the Eastern Russian Army, is Nikolai Nikolovich, he decides to inspect the camp. And this is when you know, the German officers, the Ottoman officers, everyone's just taken there, all the prisoners of war. Um, and, um, and he's sort of inspecting, everybody is expected to get up by the uh, jackets. Sai so Nursi is just sitting down, he's not getting up. When he walks before him, he's just sitting, he's the only guy who, person who's sitting down. So then Nikolai says, says, wait a minute, okay, maybe he didn't see me. He goes around, comes up again, <laughs> and he's not getting up again. He says, why didn't you get up? Through an interpreter. He says, I am a Muslim scholar, <laughs> you're a, a kafir, you know, the uh, the, don't you know who I am? He goes, yeah, I know, you're the commander-in-chief responsible for the deaths of Muslims. I'm not going to get up before you. Um, and the, uh, Nikolai is very offended by that. He takes it as offense of Russian army, Russian people, and all of that uh, offense. And everyone's saying, just apologize, he, he's going to kill you. And, um, if you're in the middle of war, like who cares if somebody, they can shoot you, execute you quite easily. He goes, he goes, don't worry about it. I just need a passport to the other side. If this is meant to be the passport, well, and we accept it, you know. Uh, and uh, they actually set up a martial court. They trial him, and they find him guilty, and he is sentenced to death. And they're actually going to hang him. He says, uh, just before they do that, he says, can you uh, allow me to pray two rakats? Which is a customary way of you know, praying before. It's actually sunnah to do that through sahaba. Um, so when he's praying, the Nikolai Nikolovich, he actually sees him and he realizes that, hey, he's truly a religious person. He didn't mean to offend me. He was just doing... He actually comes and says, apologize, says, look, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were uh, being offensive on purpose, but I realize that you're sincere in your religion. 
So he is let go. And he's even treated quite specially after that. He's allowed to leave the camp to go to there was a small Tatar mosque near uh, River Volga. He actually writes about that mosque. There was an old woman who used to look after him a little bit. And he starts contemplating his life. He realizes the futility of politics, society. Um, his mortality, is re he's reminded of his mortality. He's uh, at the age of 40 now. I mean, 40 these days is young, but in those day, times when life expectancy was low, 40, you're getting started to get, get old or mature age. So he's becoming increasingly spiritual. And then um, the, in 1917, the communist revolution happens. And the Russia is put in disarray, and he escapes uh, the, uh, the concentration camp. Interestingly, uh, this is like still in the middle of war. He, knows, he doesn't know all these languages. He travels by himself from Kostoma, north of Moscow, to Germany. That, I find that quite interesting. It was, and he doesn't talk about this trip for some reason. And uh, we don't know how he did that. So he goes to Germany, and then through Germany he's brought back into Istanbul. And he's, uh, and at, at, at, at that time, uh, by then, Ottoman Empire lost the war. You know, Istanbul was occupied by the British army. But still, there's a government or there's some sort of uh, systems in place. Um, he's uh, greeted as a war hero and uh, celebrated, becomes more famous. And um, uh, Enver Pasha, who's one of the three main commanders responsible for bringing the Ottoman Empire into World War I, is kind of a religious guy. The other two, Talat Pasha and, and Jalal, Jamal Pasha, are not very religious. Jamal Pasha, by the way, he's very ruthless. He becomes the governor of Syria. And he does some uh, you know, ruthless things and killings, which becomes responsible for a lot of the Arab movies that depict, you know, Ottoman commanders depict him as the evil, uh, arch uh, evil person. Uh, so, uh, Amar Pasha greets him and he's appointed to uh, the office of uh, Darul uh, Hikmat al Islamiyya. Darul Hikmat al Islamiyya was a fatwa office in the caliphate. And there was a committee of notable scholars were appointed, and Said Nusri was one of them. So basically, that office is going to give this fatwa that is going, uh, related to the entire Muslim world and, and solve the problems. Remember that name, Darul Hikmat al Islamiyya. And he's given a very large salary. Uh, he, doesn't, I mean, he doesn't need all of it. He says he actually keeps some of that. And later, when he's sent to exile, the money that he saves from that is enough for him for the next 25 years. It wasn't a crash hot big money, but, uh, but he leads a very frugal life. And for example, uh, later they ask him, uh, a few decades later, how do you get by? Like, you don't work. Basically, he's in house arrest, in exile. He can't work anyway. He's old. Um, he goes, blessing of Allah and, uh, and also frugality. He goes, I'm forced to give examples, unfortunately. He goes, he's a chicken of mine. He lays eggs even in winter twice a day. He goes, one loaf, I have one loaf, it's enough for me for a month, loaf of bread. He goes, my brother brought me some honey. It lasted the three months. Uh, we had this uh, half sack of flour. It was, um, we made bread for six months from that. Then the brothers decided to measure it, but it finished straight away. Um, so it was one day they were walking on top of a mountain with his students, a couple of his students, and uh, they had only half a loaf of bread left and they were going to still stay on the mountain for a week uh, in retreat. They find on the top of a tree, 
a freshly baked bread. Uh, how, how do you explain that, you know? Uh, so he, he calls this blessings of Allah. The, uh, and then frugality, obviously, he says, look, I have this uh, robe that I wear. Um, I bought it as a second hand seven years ago. And it still looks good, you know. Because I only have one, one. I don't have another one. And he's got some, I don't know, shirts, underwear, and things like that. Uh, as, as much as he could put in a basket with his teapot, a copy of Quran, and his uh, prayer mat. That's all his possessions in the world. Uh, teapot, you got to have the teapot, you know. <laughs> uh, that's the drink of the scholars, you know. Uh, yeah, so, because that's how I make ends meet. He actually, later, when he's exiled in 1925, uh, he has other notable friends, like the tribal leaders, you know, scholars, they're, they're rich, because they finish their money in a few months. They try to live as they were living before, and quickly the money ran out. So, he, uh, I mean, he, he says, you know, I have some students, they had two kilos of honey, they finished it in uh, uh, one week by giving it, offering to each other. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. And uh, because I had one kilo of honey, I gave uh, everybody one teaspoonful a day. It lasted us for whole Ramadan. <laughs> you know, and he used to make soup from lentil, drink the soup, and then dry the, you know, the, uh, the rest, make soup again, and then eat that dry it again and make soup again. <laughs> um, so this is how, uh, it's actually Sunnah, like the Prophet ﷺ used to live like that. And unfortunately, we have lost that. And those of us who, some of us who say, oh, let's practice Sunnah, brother, they always forget about that aspect of Sunnah. Um, so, Said Nursi has got this job, and he's still, uh, obviously, the Ottoman Empire ended. Um, it's collapsed, basically. The entire Muslim world was colonized, with the exception of uh, Afghanistan. Thanks to Afghan brothers, you know, they always uh, maintain their independence. Even they were attempted to invade it a couple of times. British tried to invade, but they were not successful. Uh, some places in Afghanistan, maybe the interior parts of Anatolia, present-day Turkey. Uh, Iran was not officially colonized, but it was under basically Russian and British mandate control, uh, basically in times of the world. Uh, Mecca, Medina, it's just desert, you know, nobody. Petrol, petrol was discovered in 1938, uh, so <laughs> Saudi Arabia became important after that. Uh, so, and at that time he's going through this crisis and he sees his third dream. And the third dream, uh, he says, I find myself before a, a mighty council made up of people from every century. And I went to the door and out of, you know, uh, respect, I started to, I did not enter, I, you know, just stood next to the door. And they told, they said to me, come, Said, the, the man of the, uh, the era of destruction, the representative of the era of destruction, you have a voice in this too, as well. And he goes in, they start to question him about why did Muslims lose? Why did, what's going to happen? And uh, is there a future? You know. And he gives these amazing answers. Uh, for example, he says, well, uh, we haven't prayed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us guard ourselves for 24 hours a day. We did not give zakat. We lost all of our property. Uh, we did not fast. We lost all our, all our food and harvest and so on. So the Qadr-i-Ilahi took it from us as a compensation. 
And, uh, and he even says, he says, like two million people were martyred, uh, especially in terms of battlefields. Because now they're martyred, they're all in paradise. But maybe if they were survived, they would not, they would have probably been uh, rebelled against Allah SWT, or going to Kufr, you never know. So he gives these very positive answers, and is still hopeful, and analyzes the situation really well. And then uh, he says, I'm not, I'm not permitted to explain the rest of the dream. Now, <laughs> you know, obviously the interpretation of this dream is that all the major scholars of the, the Mujaddids of each era were present in this council, and he is this sort of dream kind of confirms that Mujaddid title uh, as some scholars come, uh, interpret that as. Uh, Said Nursi uh, never claimed uh, the Mujaddid title. I think only in one place when people said, his students, we see you as a Mahdi. He goes, don't say that. Uh, Mahdi will have three jobs and it's impossible for one person to do all three. But maybe you could call him Mujaddid. But that's only the time that he kind of uh, acknowledges that. Um, so after that dream, he starts getting into this crisis mode. And the crisis as in, what do we do now? Okay, there is, Islam is the solution, Quran is there. But how do we go about it? How do we diagnose the main problem and what's our prognosis? And at that time he decides to, he goes through a personal crisis first. He actually decides to, uh, before that, he comes across this book written by Abdul Qadir Jilani, his great great grandfather. And the book is called Futur al Ghaib, The Opening of the Unseen. And it starts with a sentence like this. Enter fi dar al-hikmah fa'atlub tabiba yudawi qalbak. You who is in dar al-hikmah. He says, subhanAllah, he's talking to me. You know he's in dar al-hikmah al-Islam here. Obviously, Abdul Qadir Jilani, he's, he calls dar al-hikmah as the, this world. This world is a board of uh, wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things happen beyond the veil of causes and effect, and Allah is unseen. He goes, look for yourself a, um, a cure for your diseases of your heart. Look for a doctor who will cure your heart. And he goes, he says, okay, Ustaz, uh, you become my uh, doctor. He goes, I decided to read the book. Uh, uh, as a remedy for my spiritual uh, illnesses. And he goes, it was so painful I could only read it halfway. He, he leaves it. Because it was amazingly painful. And he goes, after the wounds healed, I, just, I went back and finished the whole book. And he said, Alhamdulillah, I, he, he does an operation, spiritual operation on him. Uh, the second, the second uh, kind of a extraordinary uh, aspect is that he, he, when he's reading the Mektubat of Imam Rabbani, which we talked about last week, Ahmed Sirhindi, his Mektubat, he, he opens the page and it comes to a letter which is addressed to Mirza Badu Zaman. He goes, SubhanAllah, once again. His father's name is Mirza and Badu Zaman is his, his, his epithet. He goes, I read it as if it's written to me. And the advice of uh, Imam Rabbani there is, he goes, take a teacher and stick to the teacher. And have only one qibla, you know, one direction. Don't go too many, too much either side. He, he says, okay, uh, he takes from that advice, he goes, who am I going to follow? Who am I going to follow? He looks at past, present. He goes, since all scholars, I mean, he's a great scholar himself, right? He says, since every scholar get their inspiration from the Qur'an, I decide to follow the Qur'an and take it as my teacher, main teacher, nothing else. That's when he abandons all those 90 books. 
But he says that all those 90 books were obviously prepared him to really understand the Quran. And he goes, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was granted with Risale Nur, his main books. Because they're all inspired from the truths of the Quran. Um, so, solution is, first he he's, uh, kind of does this uh, Tazkiyat to nafs and, uh, and then he is looking for a solution, and he finds a solution in the Quran. He's also at that time considers Sufism and philosophy, you know, theology, all of those things. But he finds that philosophy, only a few people can understand it properly. Because he, he needs to find a way that would help most people, most Muslims, or everybody. Sufism, he says, again, it's elitist. When you bring it down to the level of ordinary believers, people misunderstand things from sophisticated spiritual concepts. And also, uh, Sufism is based on uh, a strong Iman, a strong faith. And people in this time have a faith problem. So he decides to uh, say, his main diagnosis is that the main disease hitting the entire Muslim world is a disease of Iman. Is that everybody is struck with this uh, weakness in faith, doubts, or even atheism. It, Muslims, Muslim world. And he, he says, we, I'm going to write books that will strengthen the Iman and show, prove that the truths of Quran are actually true, beyond the shadow of the doubt, beyond imitation, taklid. It's going to be tahkik al-Iman. Uh, an Iman that's based on evidence and proof. And actually, before that moment, before World War I, he decides to write uh, a commentary of the Qur'an, a full commentary, and actually he starts it. It's called Isharatul Ijaz, there's one volume only. Uh, but uh, when the war breaks, he's actually sometimes, when they're fighting in the battlefield, he's dictating to his students, right? <laughs> And um, it's very, actually, a very good tafsir. It starts with Fatiha and then goes up to 30 verses of Baqarah. But he can't finish it. Obviously, he's wounded and captured. And his intention was to write 60 volumes of tafsir. But he realizes that Muslim, ordinary Muslims don't read tafsir books. But who's going to read that 60 volumes? So he writes differently. He, he still calls his Risale Nu books tafsir of the Qur'an, but in a different kind. Not a verse by verse, but uh, focusing on the truths of the Qur'an. He calls haqiqat al-Qur'an. Um, so he's now, he's got a, he, he's resolved, he's got a way, he's going to focus on Qur'an, focus on strengthening Iman, and uh, he decides, to, he goes to back on to Eastern, uh, he's actually, by then, Mustafa Kemal is, uh, they are starting this independence war in 1920 and they are inviting him, come join us, you know, support the independence war against the Greeks and the British. Uh, you know, there's uh, even Italians, French in the south, the whole place is being carved. Uh, so there's this massive uh, independence war that's happening. He actually goes to Ankara, the present day capital of Turkey, and they established a parliament. Mustafa Kemal is the head of the parliament, also the commander-in-chief. Um, it's a legitimate, proper government, and, po and the people are supporting it. He goes, I went, I went to the parliament. They, everyone greets him nicely. He finds that only a minority of the members of parliament are praying, Salat. This is not good. It's establishing something new. And it's starting on wrong foundations. He writes a he writes a, a an article, a paper on why salat is important, and why the representatives of the people must pray first. And it's very convincing. And a lot of people, a lot of the members of the parliament actually starts to pray, and they have to enlarge the masjid in the parliament because of that. And Mustafa Kemal gets angry. He goes in a in a public sort of a display of confrontation, 
he says, Hoja, Hoja, like Hoja is the sheikh in Turkish. Uh, Hoja, Hoja, we invited you to benefit from your intellect and your support and, and all you do, the first thing you do is talk about Salat. And, and uh, Said Nuri, that's usually, he's a very powerful political figure. A lot of people cannot stand up to that. But Said Nuri does, he goes, puts his finger and says, Pasha, Pasha, you know, the most important thing in the universe is Iman, and after Iman is Salat. And those who pass opinions, their opinions cannot be trusted if they don't pray. And then, uh, obviously, Mustafa Kamal is taken back by that. Uh, and uh, so sort of, uh, Said Nusra basically decides to leave after that point. And he goes to the station and Mustafa Kamal runs after him. And, uh, and actually he makes a proposal, Mustafa Kamal, he says, look, we'll make you the chief preacher for the East. And... Uh, he will get a massive salary, uh, a large mansion, and we'll, we'll make you the member of the parliament. How about that? Said Nusi refuses all of that. He later says that I realize I cannot work with people like that, and I, uh, it, was, it would be futile to do that. And it was also a way, you know, when you are taking a big salary from the state, I, can you speak against it? Probably you can't. Or you cannot do an independent movement that he was thinking about. Uh, basically, you'll be confined. And, um, but also, there's a price to be paid with that, isn't it? Because you're going to suffer from that politically. And he goes to the East uh, and starts you know, preaching. Uh, he goes to the retreats. There's a small mystery that's built. In um, and in 1925, so by 1925, the Republic is established, Caliphate is abolished, and all these reforms that look like Islam is being removed from society are being passed. And everyone's alarmed, all religious people. Uh, there's another Sheikh Said, and usually Said Nusi is confused with him, is Sheikh Said of Piran. He actually decides to rebel against the government. And he's kind of Kurdish scholar. He goes to Said Nusri, he goes, we're going to rebel, support us. And here we get a very good idea of the concept of jihad. He goes, what are you doing? What are you going to do, sorry? He goes, we're going to make jihad against. Who are you going to make jihad to? Against Mustafa Kemal. Do you think Mustafa Kemal is going to fight you? No. Who are you going to fight? He goes, soldiers. Who are the soldiers? You know, Muslims, ordinary Muslims, they're just going to do what they're commanded. He goes, his side nurse says, you cannot have jihad in the same society. Oh, sorry, you cannot have military jihad in the same society. Because that would be anarchy. Because that's why, you know, the Prophet ﷺ never did anything military in Mecca. Even though they were oppressed more than they were oppressed in Medina. Because that would be anarchy, civil war. Because we can't do that. We can't, we can't rebel, because you're going to end up killing Muslims, they're going to kill you, and it's going to be chaos. And it'll be a reason for oppression. As well, uh, well, Sheikh Said of Piran does not listen. They go rebel, they're quashed, they're all killed and executed. But, but what happens as a result?